hosting this event. This is a, a recorded event. Um, so just keep that in mind as we get started. Um, but we are going to jump right in to today's panel and get things going. Um, we will be using the spotlight function. So different parts of this panel, uh, different points of this um, panel, uh, folks' faces may suddenly become much larger on your screen. So just letting you know, um, but we're really excited that we get to be with everyone today and we get to see everyone. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and spotlight myself. All right, let's get started. So hi everyone and welcome to Navigating Blackness, the first panel in Unpacking WHA, a series on identity inclusion for Fulbright programs in the Western Hemisphere region, otherwise known as Fulbright WHA. I wish to remind everyone again that this panel is being recorded and that we kindly request that all viewers keep themselves on mute until we announce time for Q&A. We have the settings right now set up where participants are muted automatically. So this panel event's gonna run for 90 minutes and it will end at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'm Jeremy Gaman Sperling, he, him, his, el or ele, and I'm the Fulbright WHA Diversity Inclusion Liaison. I'm a white man with a beard in a sort of maroon collared shirt with glasses. My role is to support all Fulbright WHA partners, including commissions, US embassies, cooperating agencies, and colleagues of the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs. I operate out of the Fulbright Commission in Lima, Peru, even though I'm right now sitting here in New Jersey. My role is to advance the region's institutional capacity to support grantees from underrepresented communities who experience structural disadvantages due to systemic inequalities. This panel series that we're doing, where Navigating Blackness is the first of many, um, brings current grantees and alumni from across the Americas and the Caribbean who discuss issues of identity and inclusion related to the region. While each panel will center on systems of identity or on a relationship to a particular structure of inequality, these panels are intersectional in nature and welcome complex discussion and reflection that better capture the fullness of our experience and realities. Before we begin, I'd like to express thanks and gratitude to Sydney Gordon, Program Officer in the Western Hemisphere branch of ECA, and Sarah Ferguson at US Embassy Panama for all their support in co-constructing and coordinating this event with me, Valeria Benitez from Fulbright Peru for all her work on the design of our promotional materials, colleagues at US Embassy of Santo Domingo and the Institute of International Education for support and identifying panelists, to colleagues across the region at commissions, posts, cooperating agencies and ECA for helping us market and spread word about the event. And of course, to our amazing moderator and panelists who are here with us today, None of this would be possible without all of you, so thank you. Before continuing remarks and expanding on why we are here, I would like to turn things over to Morgan Newman from the Fulbright Affinity Group, Fulbright Noir. Affinity groups such as Fulbright Noir are Fulbright grantee and alumni-led organizations aimed at providing support and at amplifying the stories of Fulbrighters from underrepresented communities. The work of the affinity groups is expansive, powerful, and needed, and I know that their work has played a huge role in creating space for positions like mine. I turn to Morgan now, now to share more about the affinity groups generally, Fulbright Noir specifically, and how listeners can get involved. Hi guys. Um, so Jeremy started a little bit. So Fulbright Noir is a grantee and alumni led program where we kind of all try to come together and, and learn how to navigate blackness abroad um, and, and inform community. So Fulbright Noir was founded four years ago by four current four Fulbright grantees um, and they just wanted a space to talk about their experiences because while Fulbright um, is amazing as a Fulbright grantee to Cyprus in 2019 and 2020, it can also be really isolating and it's really um, hard for a lot of people to go across the world and, and, uh, and understand and learn how to navigate their racial identity abroad. So that's what uh, Fulbright Noir is all about. Uh, the first year, second year Fulbright Noir was created. They actually had um, a, a conference in Belgium. So people, Black Fulbrighters from all across the world, mainly Europe, came together um, and really shared their experiences. And I think that's something that um, we really want to continue after the pandemic. But since then, we've expanded. I'm the first full, uh, fundraising chair of Fulbright Noir. And we really want to make Fulbright a really inclusive experience for everyone and to make sure that all of our grantees, all Black grantees, can really experience the most out of, out of Fulbright. Um, and so since Fulbright Noir was founded, there have been several other affinity groups and diversity groups that have also kind of popped up. So there's Fulbright Prism, 
um, which focuses on L the LGBTQ plus community. There's Fulbright Salon, there's Fulbright Lotus, Full Bridge, Fulbright HBCU. So really we, we formed a diversity collective like the, uh, that we like to call it ourselves. And we really just wanna make sure everybody who has some form of marginalized identity, they feel seen within Fulbright um, and that we can come together and have community and really express ourselves and, and understand, you know, what it's like to, to be abroad or to, to be in a new place and feel, you know, maybe a little bit alone, but know that you have somebody who's experiencing, you know, some of the same things. So that's my little spiel about Fulbright Noir. Um, if you guys are interested in learning more, feel free to follow our Instagram. I believe it's, it's plugged in the chat. That's probably the best way to reach us. Um, you can DM us with anything. Um, if you're applying to Fulbright and you want um, some help on applications, we would love to connect you with somebody who's been in the country that you're applying to or someone who just, you know, is happy to look over your application. That's what we're here for, to uplift you guys and to, to be a resource. So please don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can also give us an email, but um, we'll be here and we'll be, we'll be there to respond and to help you in any way that we can. So thank you guys for doing this and thanks for having me. Let's just please show appreciations, whether in the chat or with reactions to Morgan and to Fulbright and you are for everything they're doing and all the affinity groups. Uh, also naming that one of our panelists, Cynthia Vasquez, was also featured on Fulbright Noir's Instagram in the past few days. So please, please, please check that out. And with that said, um, I'm going to continue now to sort of talk a little bit more about this panel. Um, but before doing that, and before doing that, I also want to highlight that we are in the 75th anniversary year of Fulbright. So other events like this panel are happening all year throughout the world and with various organizations and partners. So please check out the page that we are, as I, I believe some will be placing in the chat for the Fulbright 75th anniversary page with many events. All right, I wanna get us to our panelists. So I'm gonna run through some remarks now. So I wanna turn our attention to today's panel, Navigating Blackness in the Western Hemisphere. What I wanna say is this, um, I believe very much in the Fulbright goal of mutual understanding. The idea that intercultural learning can foster the type of relationships across borders needed to better heal our hurting world. With that said, mutual understanding and something I also heard in, in Morgan's remarks is that for it to be a true embodied experience and structural reality means that all of our stories must be told and heard, not just some. The reality is that black and Afro-descendant folks from across the Western hemisphere are still underrepresented in international exchange and education programs at large and within Fulbright itself. Specifically to this region of the Western hemisphere, the Americas and the Caribbean, the histories of colonialism and slavery that have shaped so much of the racial power structures and hierarchy still live with us and continue to present barriers to black and Afro-descendant communities and often offer more privilege to white and often lighter skinned communities. This is not to obscure or ignore the amount of programming and initiatives started by commissions, post, ECA, and cooperating agencies in the Fulbright program, or also to ignore the amount of advocacy and activism by entities and individuals like the affinity groups in working towards more inclusion over the 75 years of Fulbright ex existence. These have made undeniable and needed impacts and changes and let's celebrate that work. But it is to say that there's still more work to be done. Today's panel, while no way a panacea for these issues is an opportunity to live out our value of mutual understanding, to present a platform to amplify deep and rich conversations and storytelling on navigating black and Afro-descendant identity abroad. And as our panelists will discuss, this is also an opportunity to acknowledge that blackness is not a monolith. To more fully grasp black and Afro-descendant identity as a diverse abundance of experiences, knowledge, joy, culture, and ways of being in the world further impacted and mediated by the other areas that make up who we are. Conversations such as this one can be deeply personal. And we must always remember that the personal is always political. In that vein, I ask us all as audience members to think about what brings us to this space in our heads and in our hearts. I imagine most of us are here because we either identify with the topics and themes, we wanna learn more, and, or as in my case as a white man, trying to understand each day what it means to be a stronger ally in racial justice and change. What I wanna say is that all of us have a stake and an accountability in shifting the needle on practices of inclusion in international education. And we need to, under, we need to ask ourselves, what does mutual understanding mean to us? As a white queer Jewish man, establishing mutual understanding means embracing my own vulnerability and compassion to see our deep connections, how our struggles are interconnected. 
I see how my queerness is linked to that of other communities, whether because of the similar yet different dynamics of oppression we experience, or in this case, in connection with other queer and trans black folks across the Americas and the Caribbean. I at the same time recognize, especially during this month, Pride Month, the ways that historically white queer and trans stories have been uplifted over the critical work and histories of black and Afro-descendant queer and trans people who have been at the forefront of struggles for equality. So I think about what my role as a white queer person can be in shifting those dynamics. So I, again, I ask us all to take a moment, reflect, and just ask ourselves, how can we build a world of mutual understanding where all of our stories are told and none must be fight to be heard? And what can we learn from the stories of our panelists and moderator today to support that work? So with those questions in mind, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce our moderator and panelists. I'm gonna start with our moderator, Malaika Maribel Serrano, pronouns she, her, hers. Malaika is the VP for Diver Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Guild Education. Several of her previous roles include Head of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for World Strides, Faculty Program Director in the Dominican Republic in Colombia, Recruiting BIPOC Students for the U.S. Department of State's Critical Language Scholarship Program, Study Abroad Advisor at U of Tennessee, and Associate Director at NAFSA, Association of International Educators. She finds joy in volunteering with women's leadership groups and has received multiple awards, including a Fulbright Fellowship in Excellence in Diversity and Inclusion from University of Maryland. Malika also received her BA from University of Southern California, an MA from University of Maryland, a Diversity and Inclusion Certificate from Cornell University, and is a doc student at Universita Católica del Sacro Cuore in Milan. Next, we're moving on to our panelists, where we have Cynthia Vasquez, pronouns she, her, or they, uh, Cynthia is currently a student at New York University via the Fulbright program. She's from Peru. Cynthia is an industrial engineer specializing in strategy, scalability, and management of commercial projects. She identifies as an Afro-Amazonian queer person who is a community organizer, poet, and independent writer from Peru. As mentioned, she's currently pursuing a master's in Latin American and Caribbean studies focused in social justice and innovation at NYU. Her research and actions are focused on financial and spiritual liberation for historically underinvested communities. And her goal is to generate the foundations to eradicate generational financial disparities for underinvested and segregated communities in Peru. Welcome, bienvenidos, bienvenidos, Cynthia. Next, we have Prisca Gales, who was a, on the US student program doing a study research to Argentina between 2017 to 2018. Prisca is Assistant Professor of Sociology and Gender, Race, and Identity Studies at the University of Nevada, Reno, where she, er she earned a PhD in Latin America Studies with, do with a doctoral portfolio in African and African Diaspora Studies and Women's and Gender Studies from the University of Texas at Austin in 2020. Before joining the University of Nevada, she was the Gaius Charles Boland Dissertation Fellow in Africana Studies at Williams College from 2018 to 2020. She is also a former U.S. Fulbright and Tinker Foundation Fellow. Her current research includes a 22-month ethnography of how emotions permeate the macro and micro politics of Argentina's Black movement. Her research is part of a broader goal of understanding the diverse ways that Blackness is politicized across the African diaspora and as a tool to demand racial justice in spaces of Black invisibility. Thank you so much for being here, Prisca. Next, we are with Sheila Encarnacion Castillo from the Dominican Republic, who's currently studying at Northeastern University doing a master's in public policy, pronouns she, her. Sheila Encarnacion graduated summa cum laude with a Bachelor of Laws from Pontificia Universidad Católica Madre Maestra in 2015. In her youth, she volunteered with the movement of Dominican Haitian women and, is, and this experience influenced her decision to work with human rights. After graduation, she joined the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, where she did advocacy work for the right to a nationality of Dominicans of Haitian descent and for the rights of asylum seekers and refugees in the Dominican Republic. Currently, Sheila is a legal interpreter and as a Fulbright grantee, she's pursuing a master's of public policy at Northeastern in Boston. Welcome, Sheila. And last but certainly not least, Matthew Holloway, pronouns he, him, um, alum of the U.S. Student Program, serving as an English teaching assistant or ETA to Panama in the 2017-2018 years. Matthew B. Holloway is the founder and executive director of Conversations by Courage, LLC, an engagement consulting and training firm that builds relationships with communities and organizations to co-create approaches towards cultural conflicts and social issues. His inspiration began as a pandemic, civil unrest, and divisive political environment have revealed the vulnerability of democracy to fear, irrationality, and demagoguery. In particular, George Floyd's horrifying death drove him to think beyond his current career path and find one in which he can better respond 
chew and make sense of our collective mess. With more than five years of experience, he's learned how to leverage relationships to manage the diverse perspectives and needs of stakeholders to achieve program outcomes in rural, urban, and international settings. In addition, Matthew holds a BA in sociology, has a graduate certificate in instructional design from University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, and is pursuing his master's in conflict management and resolution from the University of San Diego, where he will serve as a practice fellow at the Kroc Institute for Peace and Justice. So, Matthew, welcome as well. Thank you all for letting me take some time just to speak and read. And let me go ahead and let's get started with our panelists. So we're going ahead and begin to pin everyone and we're gonna get this show on the road. Malika, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, friend. And hello, everyone. Um, good afternoon or good evening. I'm not sure where in the world you all are, uh, but it's so great to be here. And I don't know about you, but I'm excited. I am so excited about this panel today. Y'all aren't gonna hear much from me, except I'm gonna be asking questions of our friends in the room because I cannot wait for you all to hear the richness and the incredible work and insights that they all have to share. So we, I got a sneak preview earlier this week um, and you all are in for a treat. So I'm very excited about this. Um, so to my panelists, I have um, uh, something I'd like to ask for you all to do. Um, I'm going to um, say your names and then ask you to respond. Um, but I'd love for folk to know um, where you're coming from. I know uh, Jeremy just read our bios, but I think it's helpful just to hear it again, where you're from and also where you currently are. So we're gonna do a very quick kind of round robin of that. And then I'm gonna launch into our first question. Sound good? All right, so I'm gonna go Cynthia, then I'm gonna go Prisa, um, Prisca, then I'm gonna go Matthew, then I'm gonna go Shayla. Okay, hi everyone, thank you so much for having me. My name is Cynthia. I am an Afro-Peruvian person and currently I am in bed Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> Thank you, Cynthia. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Prisca Gales. I'm originally from Oakland, California um, and I live in Reno, Nevada, uh, but I'm currently visiting a family in Tampa, Florida. Matthew? Hi, everyone. So my name is Matthew Holloway. I'm from Mississippi, Como, Mississippi, to be exact, uh, home of the greatest steakhouse uh, in the world. But I'm currently living in Mexico for the past two months. Thank you, Matthew. I'm Shayla Encarnacion. I am from the Dominican Republic, from Santo Domingo, and I'm living right now in Jamaica Plain in Boston. Fantastic, thank you. Um, all right, panelists, so I'm going to go ahead and launch into um, the first question, and this is actually leading off of um, Jeremy's wonderful introduction. So Blackness. Blackness is not a monolith, nor is it a U.S. invention. And so what I'd love to hear maybe a minute or so from each one of you is how you define or understand Blackness and what language or languages do you use to express it? And so I'm gonna go in reverse order this time. I'm gonna start with Shayla, and then I'm gonna to go to Matthew, then I'm gonna to go to Prisca, then I'm gonna end with Cynthia. Thank you, that's such a good question. And to me, Blackness is an amalgam of experiences, of shared experiences with fellow Dominicans in my particular case with whom I have similar phenotype or um, ancestry, particularly with black Dominicans and who as a result of these characteristics, this common characteristics have been navigating existence in a particular way. And if I had to use a word to define my um, ethnic identity, I would say I'm an Afro-Dominican. I feel like that word encompasses the most elements um, that define my identity. Uh, this is a great question, I agree. Uh, 
I would say it can't be defined. And I think it's dangerous to define it um, in part because it has infinite meaning. It's just, ask me in 20 years, I might give you a different definition, a different understanding. But I will say how I experience it currently is much of a spiritual force. Uh, that really reminds me of the saying, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And I think it's, um, it's the ability to kind of tap into what I call like the great beyond where there is no definitions in language and it just becomes futile. And I think because uh, particularly the Afro-American experience in the US, I, it's that intimate relationship with death and suffering that creates such a powerful channeling of creativity, joy and fearlessness. And so for me, I think at its best, Blackness is this, is this ability to tap into the non-physical to allow us to do things and experience things beyond our own comprehension and abilities. Ooh, preach on that one, like the antithesis. Feel that. Oh, Preska. Thank you so much, um, Shayla and Matthew. Can I cut and paste what you said and then add on to it? <laughs> Um, absolutely. Um, so I, I don't try to define blackness um, because it is so heterogeneous, because it is so malleable even, right? If we think about um, blackness as a socially constructed category, it's also always shaping and shaped by social forces. And so what I, in terms of how I try to understand it, um, is through ex exactly what I do, that study and research that is the opposite of US, not only US centric, but I also try to decenter the largest voices. And so when I say I study blackness and spaces of black invisibility, what does it look like for Afro-Chilenos, for, for Afro-Argentinos, for Afro-Mexicanos to politicize their blackness as they say, yes, I am Afro-Mexican, Afro-Argentine, and this is what that means. And that you don't get to say what is or what isn't blackness. So in terms of trying to understand it, um, I tried to study the ways in which it has been constructed in different societies, but also the ways in which black people all over the Western hemisphere ha have built their own meanings and pushed back against um, systemic forces. And so another way that I understand it in, in, in spite of the heterogeneity is to also understand, and this is why I believe that I focus on black diaspora studies is those similar histories of oppression through the colonial experience. And that is something that we see um, it, if you look at social indicators, we talked about how even within Fulbright, this place that's supposed to be, this is, it's, you know, the, the goal is mutual understanding where you see this underrepresentation of black folks and Afro descendants in so many different social categories. And so I think that another way that I understand it is to understand it also from that point of um, a, a common place of oppression as well. So I will leave it there. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, um, everyone, for your amazing remarks. Um, to me, Blackness is an identity that you're born with. And no matter like the shape or form that you are in, like uh, African blood runs from within in each of every one of us. Um, and that also means that Blackness is a legacy. It's a legacy uh, of a culture filled with resilience, a legacy filled with spirituality. And Blackness is, is beauty, is excellence, is wealth, uh, is resilience, like I said, and it's turning, especially in the Western Hemisphere, when, where it's so difficult for us to track our African ancestors because of the expulsion that their bodies suffered. Um, even so, we have created all of these, um, we have recreated uh, everything that makes us unique, that makes us be together. And yeah, I'm just so proud of my legacy and I'm so proud to be here with you all. I say that, love it, love it. Yes, yes. Whew. All right, y'all. Um, I told you it was a bit hot panel friends in the room. Okay. So um, also uh, leading into uh, Jeremy's opening remarks, I want to hold space for the conversation around intersectionality. Intersectionality. Um, and I'm going to start with Prisca. Um, but I want to hold space in case our other panelists would like to chime in as well. Um, but Prisca, could you share with us uh, the importance of intersectionality 
um, in discussing these issues around blackness and maybe more specifically looking at supporting black and Afro descendants, uh, Afro descendant Fulbrighters. Yes, thank you so much of that, for that question. Um, and so I think because my, I, well, my very existence, but also my teaching, my scholarship, my work is through an intersectional lens. I often like to start with um, saying what intersectionality is not. And that might seem like a very like obvious thing, but I find that um, all the time you see intersectionality being defined in so many ways, or often it's just seen as, oh, it's when multiple social identities intersect. But if we honor the work and legacies of Black women who have come up with that term, I mean, even Kimberly Kinshaw says that, you know, that term was the first to use that term, but that's from a long history of Black women's work. Um, that it's not only about the intersection of social identities, but the cumulative ways that those identities can intersect and result in someone's oppression, right? That looks different in different ways, depending on those intersections. And so what that means for me is um, when I study Blackness, whether it be in the United States and Argentina and other parts of the world, I think it's also to understand um, so going back to the word heterogeneity, what does that look like? Who are the communities I'm studying in, in this particular place or working with and what are their particular experiences, but also what are the different ways in which they're intersecting forms of oppression, right? So we think uh, we often think about class being one of them. We often think about uh, gender identity and sexuality being one of those intersections. And so what I'll, what I'll use as an example is one of my main focal points into the work I do with black women in Argentina is their participation um, in the feminist movement, right? And why was it? Why is it important? Why was it important that in those big, large March H feminist marches that they march as a unified black, uh, like with banners that say for an intersectional feminism, for an anti-racist feminism? What does that mean, right, for them? And then just the the work that um, for for so many years that black and trans activists has contributed to the feminist movement. And now in Argentina, you see the, 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 or the LGBTQI movement really emerging in the feminist movement in Argentina and not so much black women's activism, but these parts have always, they didn't just emerge in the 20th century now that we have forms of, of they have more forms to share their words through social media, right? Um, and so when I, in my interviews, I said there's histories of this is like a moment of, of finally this, but also we need this as well. And so what that means for me in terms of my um, discussing issues related to blackness, especially when I teach, but also when I travel is that I am all that 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 listening, right? Um, and, and, and decolonial black feminism is this act of listening to the experiences of people, right? And that is how I, I really learned to talk about blackness as a person, uh, writing about Blackness in Argentina and not being from there, right? So that form of active listening and, and citing Black women, right? Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And, and kind of ending on that note of that active listening. Uh, and I, I don't know if you can see up on my screen, but I see a lot of folk who are actively engaging in that. Um, Want to hold space for um, our other panelists to see if there's anyone else who'd like to make a comment, maybe a quick comment around intersectionality um, before I kind of segue into a different topic, which is looking at more the grant preparation. Nope. All right. Okay. So, um, so this next uh, couple of questions are going to be centering around uh, grant preparation. And so actually, uh, I'm going to start off with Shayla and then go to Cynthia and then go to Matthew. Um, but hoping you can share um, with our friends in the room here. Number one, what led you to apply for the Fulbright? Uh, and, and how did you even learn about it? Great. Um... In my particular experience during my work in the Dominican Republic, um, uh, we did a lot of work of advocacy and we did a lot of work of capacity building with um, government and civil society organizations. And there was something that was cross cutting to all of our projects. There was always a civil servant or a public servant who could push or crush our month's worth of work. And I realized that I wanted to be on the other side of advocacy. I wanted to work closely with government and I wanted to work within government to be that ally that we needed as um, 
people who worked with um, human rights. And I needed to expand my toolkit. And the, the way to do that was um, through a master's degree in public policy. That's what I identified at the time. And I knew so many Fulbright alumni within my colleagues um, who were changing a lot of things in the Dominican Republic and who had transformative experiences through this, through this program. And I didn't wanna be left out. So I applied. Uh, we worked closely with USAID also on some of our projects. So I learned about um, programs, um, educational programs that um, were happening within the US um, State Department. And that was something that pushed me um, toward uh, these programs. But the main focus of my studies in the US is knowing how to design policy that's inclusive for all. We worked um, for so long in these subjects in this um, working with Dominicans of Haitian descent and their access to their nationality. And we need people from the inside who are, who are thinking about policy in an inclusive way. And I wanted to be that person and that ally, and that's why I'm here. Cynthia, can we hear from you next? Yes, uh, thank you, Sheila, and thank you, Malega, for the introduction. Um, well, in my case, um, as Jeremy said, I'm an industrial engineer, uh, but at the same time, I'm a, a community organizer and activist in my country uh, for afro peruvian women and for, for queer communities as well. Um, I'm also a first generation student, so meaning that I'm the first person in my family to go to college. Uh, I, so I was living like two parallel lives, like one developing my career as an engineer in the corporate world, where I quickly escalated uh, being the lead strategist for tech and retail companies national wide. And at the same time, I was doing my thing with my communities, um, <laughs> organizing and just um, preserving our joy and trying to heal um, as a community. Uh, my job was all about finding impact meaning like in this case profit or sustainable impact for uh, companies so the more that uh, companies requested more things for me or gave me more props or like yes you're doing amazing i was thinking about the impact that i was having and i had more impact in my communities by doing uh, like the organizing that i could do for free <laughs> that going to uh working in, in those corporations that were great but that we're still missing a lot of way into um, what was truly was truly in equity and inclusion. So I organized with a group of Afro Peruvian women where we had a school that was independent just for us to talk about how we felt and learn things that in a school they don't teach you. And through uh, Black organizations is that I understood what Fulbright was because also something that we need to understand is that information is power. And especially first generation students, we don't have access, a lot of access, like we don't have a, a blueprint. Uh, no one tells us that these things exist. And still we are the best, the first one in, in our classes because black like excellence, right? We have to try uh, four times, five times harder to than anyone else. So I, found out about Fulbright like that. And I have found out about like three days before the application was closing and I applied. And luckily there was a new director that was uh, a feminist person that understood intersectionality. Uh, and so she, uh, and well, everyone gave me the opportunity to be here. And I decided that I know that structural problems need structural solutions. So even if I'm a science person and an engineer, I wanted to study social sciences to be able to understand more the economic and social uh, situations of Latin America in my country, to be able to actually create tech projects that will have sustainable social and political economic impact from a like, wider perspective. So yeah, that's how I found out about <laughs> Fulbright. Thank you. And Matthew. 
So um, I, I found out about the Fulbright uh, in college. I think it might have been in my junior year. I heard it from my faculty advisor. But the reason why I wanted to apply for the Fulbright because I needed a good reason. Well, I needed a way to get back to Panama. Uh, so when I was 16 years old, coming from a very small town, about 1,500 people in the South, it was my first time going out of the country. And we went to Panama on a missionary trip. And it blew my mind that, that there were people who looked just like me and spoke Spanish. So. I curious Joe, like I was just like, what is this and why haven't why has anyone told me this? And another part of the element of the trip is was uh, obviously doing missionary work in some of the communities, poorest communities around the capital of the country. I got to really engage with some of the students and they really left an indelible, indelible impression upon me. And they made me promise to come back. Mind you, I'm like 16 years old to come back. And so when I had the opportunity to apply for the Fulbright, it felt right to make that uh, commitment come true. You kept your promise. <laughs> not a politician though, so like. <laughs> I love it, I love it. Thank you, that was, that was fantastic, friends. Um, so still, uh, my next question is still sort of sitting in the space of grant preparation, um, but this time I want to kind of shift the conversation sort of back to looking at the at Black and Afro-descendant Fulbrighters. Um, this time I'm going to uh, hand the mic back over uh, to our friend um, Priska. And my question for you, my friend, is um, what kind of pre-work did you do or felt that you had to do in order to prepare for going abroad? And again, from the perspective of being Black or African descent. Um, yes. Uh, so the pre-work that I did, um, it's interesting because I even feel like um, the pre-work that I did to go abroad as a Black person is part of the ongoing work that I do every time I go back to Argentina. Uh, and so what do I mean by that? And so before, um, I think this is a part of most Fulbright U.S. student programs as you talk about, you have, you've had to have either been to the country or had some connection. Um, and so in, it's part of our part of the grant. Um, there's this um, question on talking about your previous experience in the country that you plan to study in. And so I think um, for my previous experience, I learned so much about what I would need to do to prepare to go there as a Black person. And, and so when I talk about pre-work for me, what that looks like um, is there is, there's practical pre-work, which I'll talk about in a, in a minute. But one of the most important things for me is the spiritual pre-work that I do uh, before going and while I'm there. And so um, we've already talked about how um, not only what how blackness is expressed in different places of difference, but also how you are read in other places. Although in similar ways, sometimes that they, they manifest in ways that are different. And so what do I mean by that? It means that although I've been made on countless points aware of that the fact that I'm black in the United States, the ways that that happened in Argentina are very different. And so I think one of the first things that happened, the first things that happened, this is well before I um, applied for the Fulbright. It was 2012, I was in Argentina uh, doing a six week or eight week study abroad program in human rights. Um, and I did this internship in La Plata with, the, with this wonderful, with the, the, um, with the Museo Azarini and the University of La Plata, where we looked at, we studied the African roots of the tango. Um, it was a wonderful internship, but in that route on the, the bus, it was like a two hour bus that would take from uh, Buenos Aires city into to the La Plata bus station. Um, I would have a lot of interactions on the bus where people would ask me, how much do you charge? Are you working? Um, and so, and then, and then after like sharing that with some friends that I had met in Argentina who are Argentine, they would say it was almost dismissed. Oh, like, oh, that's because black women who come to Argentina are prostitutes. And I'm like, well, surely all black women who come to Argentina are like, what about black Argentine women? No, no, most black, it's not an insult. It's just, it's an uh, assumption, right? And so for me, um, what that meant for me, it was going, it's kind of the spiritual work that I have to do to, to confront that. And sometimes almost on a daily base, basis. And then going forward um, in, in later years, in 2013 and 14, when I worked as a study abroad advisor, what that meant is, is helping black students deal with that and navigate that. And so I think the spiritual work I do in terms of deep meditation, cleansing, like writing, and, uh, and then in Argentina, even um, this dance workshop that I have with black women is um, part of the catharsis that helps me work through that. And so that's pre-work that I never would have thought I had to do in the way of like, 
where can I find um, shea butter or where can I find? And so that's part, that's kind of that practical pre-work I do uh, and that I suggest for, you know, black travelers, if you're going to a country, um, especially where there are not a lot of black people and especially in a place where people say black people don't exist, like things that you never think twice about having access to are difficult to find. And then it got to the point where the, 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 the it wasn't the second, the third time I went to Argentina, one entire full suitcase was just like hair products. I don't wear makeup, but it was just hair products. And then like other black women in Argentina, like black Argentine women were like, can you bring more of this when you come? So it was like, one time I was like, I can survive in Argentina with six months with one carry on. My two checked bags are gonna be, it was like black hair and makeup products, things that you don't have access to but that are part of your everyday existence. And without them, you it, you can start to be troubled on the inside. So I think my pre-work is always and necessarily um, spiritual, but also um, practical and like, what can I do just to survive as me? And then there's a whole lot of work that goes into like finding black community there, right? And what does that look like for me? For me, it's, you know, I work with black folks in Argentina and a social movement, but for, for students who are coming, if I'm working as a study abroad advisor, it might mean just linking them up with, there's a, a group called BAs, uh, BAs and BA, Black Americans in Buenos Aires or something like that. I'm so happy that there's the, the Fulbright Noir, right? Linking them up with things like that. And so there's a lot of work that goes into it. <laughs> Well, I'm glad this is being recorded because <laughs> you dropped so much knowledge <laughs> in that one round, girlfriend. Um, I yes, the spirituality piece. Wow, who saw? Um, one thing that you lifted up, I don't want anyone here to lose, and that is these intersections of health, safety, and security, and race and, and ethnicity. Okay, okay, because it is real. It is real. And thank you so much for for giving voice to that, um, I really appreciate your share. Thank you, thank you. Ah, all right, so now I'm going to uh, turn the mic over uh, to my friend, Cynthia. I'm gonna ask you a question, friend. And that is, um, how did you go about figuring out um, what you would need abroad to feel secure? So this is really nice, kind of continuing on with Prisca's theme here. Um, and what recommendations might you make or give to other Black and Afro-descendant Fulbrighters to support themselves? And I love this kind of pairing here because we have, um, you know, from the perspective of going to Argentina, but now we have the perspective of coming to the United States. Thank you so much. Well, Priska, your comments are on point. Um, yeah, just so amazing. And to have also so many connections because I also know a lot of Black Argentinian people and they are family and so beautiful. Um, for me, what was more important, the, one of the most important things was to have a community, um, especially in the queer community, like the concept of chosen family is very important. So one of the things that were like most important for me was actually finding that, finding a community, finding chosen family that we could have like a reciprocity inter exchange of energy where we will be rooting for each other. Like I'm rooting for everyone who's black and that is like period. <laughs> and like, I needed to find that here. And thank God I did it. Thank you to the universe, I found that. And I felt so supported um, with nothing in return. They are rooting for us. Um, it was also important to me now at this stage because I finished my first semester was to actually uh, do community work. Um, there is a group in New York called the Audre Lorde Project. So also checking their activities um, and how it's all centered in healing because that is an ongoing process as well. And so I, that's why I agree so much with the spirituality that Prisca was talking about and with the grounding on who we are and like not submitting ourselves to like imposter syndrome or things like that when we think that we're not enough. Yes, we're enough. Like it's, it, it, not believing in ourselves, it's not believing in our ancestors. And we know that they like, they're always here with us and they've been so much, um, they've done so much. So I think those things will be most important to me. Y'all took me to church today. <laughs> I'm loving this. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, all right. 
So I'm going to shift gears a little bit and um, have us kind of think and reflect around building community and navigating some of the challenges abroad. Uh, and this time, um, I'd like to start uh, with my friends. I'd like to start with Shayla and then go to Matt and then go back up to Priska. Um, so here's my question. In the early months of your grant program, so, you know, when you first arrived, uh, what was it like navigating, you know, your identity, your identities um, as both Black or African, you know, Afro-descent person, as well as thinking around other intersecting identities that you carry? And then here's the third piece, navigating how our identities present in different contexts. complex um, question. And uh, I want to start by talking about the preparation or the preparedness before coming that Priska was uh, touching upon. Because I'm on the other side of the spectrum. I did not come prepared. I, um, we were in the middle of a pandemic. We were taking care of so much that I just thought that Boston was a big city. It had to be similar to New York. It had to be a diverse city. And, uh, and I came here and I spent the first couple of days without seeing one single black person. And I went back home and I went to Google and I tried to understand what was the racial configuration of the city. And I then realized that 70% of um, Massachusetts um, residents are white. And I began to reflect on that and to kind of um, analyze how I was gonna go about that. And then I wanna uh, tell you an anecdote of my first days here. The first thing that I did when I came was um, get tested for COVID at my university. And when I go in the testing center, I have to fill out a form. Someone is helping me with the form and they are asking biographical questions like my name or where I came from. And then the person gets to the section where they're asking what, what my, my race is. And I tell him that I'm black. And then he talks about ethnicity. And I stopped for a second because of course I, I know that he was expecting me to, to identify as Hispanic or Latinx. And um, the thing is that before coming to the US and after the murder of George Floyd in the Dominican Republic, we had a search in conversations about anti-racism and, um, and we were in online forums mainly talking about how Latinidad erases Blackness. And after having all those conversations that are life-changing, I was a little bit hesitant about defining myself as Latinx or Hispanic. So I did stop for a second. Ultimately, I said that I was Latinx, but that stuck with me so much so that I had a curse last um, semester about um, research methods. And my mock proposal was about doing qualitative research on how um, international students who are Afro-Latinx identify and how they nav navigate their identities here in, in Boston and Massachusetts where so many universities and colleges are. And so, something that's so simple as filling out a form and having to identify as Hispanic after having these conversations that I'm telling you about, it's something that feels like an aggression. And it's something that you, you need to unpack and that brings a lot of analysis and reflection. Thank you. Matthew. So uh, in the first few months, uh, I would say the whole entire experience from a cultural uh, perspective was just healing and radical because it was the first time in my adult life where I felt fully integrated as a being and not so siphoned or scattered. I think when I lived in as an adult in the US, I think so much of how I saw myself was through the lens of being black and that became a dominant experience and so when I came to Panama and I saw people who looked like me and I just fit in it really allowed me to explore develop and strengthen other aspects of myself which at some point made me want to feel whole not so disintegrated I don't like that feeling and so um 
I think that started the seeds of learning how to just belong to myself. So before I'm black, before I'm a male, American, Southern, before I'm any label, I just am. Like, and ultimately I like to live in that am space so I can be malleable and flexible to my own definition. And so what I would later come to know that no group, no place, no community, no way of thinking could truly fully encapsulate me. And that was fun and scary because that means you don't really belong anywhere. But then most importantly, you can be anywhere because as long as you're home to yourself and you belong to yourself, you can come anywhere and you can say true. And so I recognize just like, as I grow, as I grow, my definitions and my understandings of myself change. And I became okay with being misunderstood as long as I could clearly articulate me to myself. And I think that was really radically powerful for me. And I didn't anticipate that. And so when I came back to the States, I mean, I was fully liberated. I, did, I, did, I was not trying to be anybody's anything. I was just trying to be Matthew. And that means I upset some black people. I upset some white people. I upset some other people. I upset, I upset everybody because I was just okay with just exploring what it was like to just be me. And to think about just my mother and her generation, I think the most radical thing I could do is to experience this being that I've been given in this lifetime and do that at all cost. So that's me. Matthew, you're getting a lot of love in the chat. Shayla, you did as well. <laughs> Here too, that was beautiful. <laughs> um, and so I was thinking about the, the early months. Um, and it's interesting because um, normally I arrive to Argentina sometime in May or late May, early June. Um, for research when the when the semester ends um, and what that means is like right away it's going to work because uh, we in, in Argentina and in Buenos Aires in the city they've actually ratified the July 25th as International Day for Black Women and Afro Descendants um, and so there's a celebration but also kind of a learning that happens so there's a lot of planning that happens around there um, there's the uh, Jornada Federales of the, of the Black communities, like a, a, um, a three-day conference that are hosted, that's hosted in various points throughout the country each year, it changes. Um, and then there is um, the National Women's Encounter, which is this very, this 32, 35 almost year old uh, meeting, national women's meeting where women from all over the country gather in a different place um, to talk about women's issues. Um, and so for a long, long time, Black women had been, uh, you know, mobilizing to be con to be included in the agenda. So uh, just asking for a workshop on Black women's issues. Um, and the first time that happened in the, the, it was 30 years after the meeting started, it was in 2016 in Rosario, Argentina. Um, and so in 2007, when I was in, uh, for kind of the first months of my Fulbright, when I was in uh, there, there was the second time that Black women would hold this workshop. Um, and so part of that, part of the reason why Black women have been asking for so long for that workshop is to talk about feminist, fem feminism in an intersectional way. And so, but one of the things that happened that really just highlighted that um, happened actually on the way back to Buenos Aires from, it was this year was in Chaco. Um, and so we were heading back and this is like, we're, we take everyone, it took like big, big buses up. And so we're heading back on the bus um, and it was myself and, and three other Black women. Uh, one was, two of them were Afro-Argentine women, uh, one was Afro-Colombian. And so um, it was very, the, the experience was, and this is something that I should also point out has happened to me um, often when I've traveled on like long bus trips and the, like kind of the Hindarmeria is like a highway patrol, they get on the bus and if you are non-white, so it could be black or indigenous, they often will ask you to see your ID um, and then maybe some follow up if they're not convinced that you are, or in the country legally. Sometimes uh, I've seen people taken off the bus um, and like have all their things searched. And it's interesting because I've almost every time that I've traveled that's happening where they've asked for my ID, but usually it stops at that point. Um, and I, I always knew that it was because I show them a US passport. Um, but I, up until that moment, I'd, I'd never had that experience happen to me while with other black women who were not from the US. And so they happened to come to me last. Um, and so, and um, what happened is first they, they the two Afro-Argentine Afro women were sitting together, the Afro-Colombian was sitting in the front and then I was sitting over on the other side. 
Um, and if you would see, so the Afro-Colombian woman, they asked her first, um, can we see your ID? And she showed them their ID. She was naturalized in Argentina. Um, they looked at it. They said, you know, what are you doing here? What do you work as? And I, you know, I'm automatically thinking like, what do they think she does for work here, right? And so, you know, she goes through, you know, I'm in school to be um, a photojournalist and this, this, this. Um, and then they get to the two Afro-Argentine women and they ask to see their IDs and something completely different happens, right? And it, this is just thinking about like, what it's like to navigate your identity as a black person, but the multiple ways that that can, what that can look like. And so what it looked like for the Afro-Argentine women is the, the, the two officers, their voices got louder and they were like, are you Argentine? And the women were like, yes, we were born here. And then they held their, uh, their national their DNI cards up to the window. So they kind of like looked through it to see if it was fake. And so there's a different experience for them where they didn't even believe that they were Argentine. So their IDs had to be fake and they stayed there for a, a, a longer time. And then when they asked me, I showed my passport. It was so fast. I don't even think the person actually, I don't even know if the person saw anything aside from my photo to validate. And it was, disculpa senora, I'm sorry. And so at that moment, um, and you know, I, I, I study my research from a positionality of recognizing that I am a US citizen doing work in another country where the United States is, you know, a, a country that has had imperial practices all over the world at this point. And so, but to have that experience viscerally of what that results in about how us four as black women who had just come and came from this big conference is talking about how we have similar experiences in that moment based on our different nationalities had very different experiences. Uh, and so what that meant for me that in that first, it was in those first few months of the, the fellowship that I, became more aware of what that means and, and what it can result in and the, the embodied experience that you could have for someone to ask you for your ID and say, I'm sorry for bothering you and to say, I don't believe you are who you say you are, right? And so for me, I think it just, it just heightened my sense of awareness of how intersectional the work that I do needs to be even as a researcher. And so. Say that, say that. All of a sudden, I, and I, you just transport me back to Caracas when, you know, and I, I saw in the, in the chat, you know, where are you from? Where are you from? And then you show your blue and all of a sudden, ay, disculpa, the senora piece. Oh, okay. Mm. No, ma'am. Okay, now I'm about to take these off. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh. Um, I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask, um, actually, Matthew, uh, one additional question around um, building community before we um, kind of move into our last section here. And then friends in the room, audience, we have, we are holding space for y'all to ask questions. I, yes, yes, I saw this. I love that. Thank you. Thank you. So get those questions ready. You can go ahead and throw them in the chat if you like. Um, but we are going to also invite folks to kind of um, unmute themselves as well. So we want to hear some more voices. But Matthew, quick question for you. And then I'm gonna ask um, Cynthia a question uh, and then we're gonna kind of close things out. Um, so my friend, quick question. Uh, what was the process uh, for you in terms of um, building community abroad? Um, and could you speak a little bit more about, you know, your experience in Panama and how important it was for you um, to find um, black and Afro-descendant folk, um, you know, either who were within the Fulbright community or outside of the community, and maybe just share a little bit more with our friends in the room, how you went about doing that. Yeah, I mean, I think thanks to just the university, um, it was a great hub to just engage with a lot of students. So I just kind of met a lot of folks that way. But I was more intentional about um, connecting with the afro antillian group in Panama, which has a huge presence there. And they have uh, a society which I partnered with and learned a lot about Black life in Panama through their lenses and had the opportunity to go to some really beautiful places in Panama, like Colón, which is a beautiful uh, sort of Afro Panamanian hub of culture and activity. And the beauty thing, beautiful thing about uh, Panama is that it, the Black roots were just very like palpable. And so in, in May, it's the Black history, it's like their version of Black History Month. And so I had an opportunity to just experience how they manifest that. And was really surprised in how well retained some of the African roots were and for always drawing back to the Congo and the drums and the instruments they use and even the fashion of clothing. So for me, it was really cool to just engage with that and learn that perspective um, and really kind of see Blackness through their lens. 
um, as an outsider and kind of see what I can learn about myself through the experience. That's beautiful. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you. So now, friends, we are at the top of the hour, um, which means that the remaining 29 minutes together is going to fly by. And again, we're going to hold space for um, our, our audience who are here uh, today to ask some great questions. And they're already kind of piling in in the chat. Um, but Cynthia, I want to turn it back to you. Um, I'm feeling energy in the room. It's nation time. It's, you know, we are we, <laughs> activation time. <laughs> So as our, as our resident activist and, and organizer, I mean, we all are activists, right? But this question, uh, my friend, is specifically for you. Um, so uh, because of the, the advocacy um, of participants and alumni, um, you know, international education is, to be honest, kind of really finally um, taking more of a, um, um, a intentional approach uh, and building an inclusive future uh, in our programs. And my question for you, um, what does an inclusive future in international education look like to you? So I will start that question with Cynthia, but again, panelists hold space if anyone else would like to kind of chime into that. Thank you, uh, Malaika. Well, to me, it looks like uh, an accountable space where we understand that we cannot ensure safe spaces for every for for everyone because we do not uh, experience everything that others do, but where we can take immediate action to create that. It looks like a place where radical tenderness and vulnerability is a synonym of courage and strength. Um, it's a place where people can tell their own stories in first person. And it's a place where the canons of what is supposed to be knowledgeable is destroyed. Um, I was just talking with a friend uh, yesterday and I, I like astrology. So uh, she was talking about how astrology was not science, but as a science person who also believes in decolonial knowledge, um, is, this is just an anecdote, but the scientific method that was created by a white men divided what science was and wasn't, right? So uh, like uh, African ancestry, spirituality, uh, the way of healing, ast astrological knowledge that has been studied by uh, African people, by indigenous people was relegated to be not science because it couldn't um, fulfill those five steps that was stipulated by a white person. So it also looks like a place that where we see who writes what we are reading and we don't just believe them because the academia tells us to, but we understand what are their motives for saying this uh, in, since which or in which place they're talking, right? And are they even talking like for me in their mother tongue? And if they're not, what does that mean? Like what are the roadblocks that that, um, you know, gives you? So yeah, and just a space where everyone can be um, can be can be there because I don't think we need representation. I think we just just need to be there. <laughs> so yeah, that that's how it looks to me. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you for that. Um, and again, um, panelists wanted to hold space to see if um, anyone else would like to kind of chime in before we gently segue over uh, and to our audience. Yeah, I would uh, like to say something. I think um, in terms of what entities like the Fulbright and other international education groups can do, especially working with um, sort of diverse communities, I think really preparing them for the possibility of, of things going well, rather than always overemphasizing the fears and threats as it relates to being Black in the world. And what I mean by that, I, and it comes from a very good place, let me state that. However, I think there's a side effect to that messaging. And I think we've all in the time of COVID have learned that we have to be careful about the, what messaging we take in and how much of it we take in before we just see the world that way. 
And I think it really creates an internalized fear that I think a lot of black travelers have about, oh, I won't go, I'm afraid to go because I have this internalized fear that I won't be accepted or something so racially crazy will happen to me without contextualizing, at least in the Afro-American experience, you live in the United States of America, a country with a deeply terrible racial history. So you're not in, in you have an experience of what it's like to live in a country that is extremely racialized. And so it's perspective and recognizing that you already have and your ancestors have already formulated tested survival kits to cope when there are threats, to cope when you are in uncomfortable situations. And I wish that groups really work with folks on helping them develop those coping skills to manage and to navigate and recognizing, hey, we already have survival kits. We know how to live and thrive in these spaces, even in the midst of oppression. And so don't think that the outside world will just reject you inherently because what you may find, in my experience, you may feel much safer elsewhere outside of the country than you're in your, doing your own homeland. That's the, poss the radical possibility. I'm in Mexico now because I wanted to leave the United States because I got tired of it, you know? And so I think it's that perspective of selling to people, hey, your whole conception of who you think you are and what safety and security might feel like and look like might be radically different once you experience a different culture. Um, and so that's the beauty of international education. And I think not trying to overemphasize the fears and threats, which are so hyper present in the United States. Um, keep that in mind, it's contextual, but that's something I would love for groups to really think about is so how can we remind folks that they have survival kits and make sure that they can navigate these waters like their ancestors have always had. So thank you. Thank you for that. Anyone else like to go before I turn it back over to Jeremy to uh, see lots of questions are popping up um, in the in the chat. No? Okay. Jeremy, I think back to you. Unmute the magic words of Zoom. Um, so we're going to turn it now over to questions from the audience. So um, we right now have everyone kind of on mute. So what we're asking for folks to do is if you'd like to share a question, um, to just either raise your hand. We, I know some folks have also put their questions in the chat as well. So um, Malika has that list, but we do wanna make this a space that if folks like to speak one-on-one -on -one with the audience to also do that. So we'll, what we'll do is we'll try our best to alternate, right? Question from the audience live, question from the list that we got going. Um, I'm actually gonna turn it over to Jackal Tanalorn, who's on, who I know put in our first question. Um, so Jackal, I'm gonna try and see if this works to ask you to unmute and if it lets you unmute. If not, I will just remove the, make it so folks can unmute themselves. Oh, okay, perfect. I got power, I can't, can't imagine. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna lower my hand. Well, thank you so much for this presentation. I just wanna say, I appreciate just the breadth of diversity that you guys represent um, in your experiences. And it was very touching in so many, so many ways. Um, and I, I did write a question in the chat, but it's kind of related to my second question as well. And you guys have touched on it a bit and it kind of speaks to what Matthew was saying about like, how do we support? Cause I work in Mexico and the commission in Mexico. And um, part of it is about, you know, like how do we, how do we get, um, how do we help uh, people of color, African-Americans especially, or African descend descendants navigate blackness in country, right? So it's like, one of the things Prissa said was that, you know, like, oh, there's, it, it's not insulting. Um, it's just an assumption that a black woman is a prostitute. So there's this thing, and I'm sure this conversation took place in Spanish, right? So it's like, it reminds me of the, of the statement, um, we're not racist, we're just curious, right? So it's like, okay, well, what does that mean to the black body? Like, how does that sit on the black body in country? And then the other thing, um, and, and this also goes for the people who are the, the Dominican and Peruvian, it's like, what is blackness, how does blackness sit in country on you guys? Like, so like, what does it mean if we send a grantee to Peru or like, how is that, how is that navigated? And then the second part of that would be the identity piece that it's like, you show your blue passport and all of a sudden 
you're American, not necessarily black, although before that blue passport you are. And so, or like on the other side, if you go into the United States, like all of a sudden you're like African American and you're no longer Latina or Latina X. And I think that that uh, Sheila talked a little about, bit about this, but there's this, these intersections of like travel and like how the different blacknesses play out in country. And that's kind of my, my question around language and, and that. The only thing I would say is that, um, I think it was for me, I, I've been traveling around the world for quite a while. So I think I had come to understand that I can't experience the world in a Petri dish or in a sanitized, like it can't sanitize itself for me. So like, I kind of like accepted that, that that's an element of the growing and learning experience is that like anywhere, if I move to Boston, if I move to Seattle, there's an element of life that will just inevitably occur. And for me, it's again, going back to, do I have, the self-care system? Do I have a coping system? Do I have a survival kit that helps me process, navigate, understand, digest, remove, secure myself as best as humanly possible? Um, because I think there's a, I, I don't know if, I don't know what one can do when you're on the ground and you're living life and you're not responsible for the comments and actions of people, people are. And so I don't think it's fair to internalize that onto a country or to a culture and just write them off because one or two instances you encounter someone who uh, discriminates against you. And so I think that's just, it's a part of the learning experience of living in an intercultural world where at any given moment, there's gonna be some mishaps, misunderstandings and perhaps even discrimination. And that's not to say we shouldn't still build infrastructure but there's an element of just, it's a part of the experience that might happen. Thank you for, for that very, um, very thought provoking quote questions, couple of questions packed in, that was good. Um, I do see we have, <laughs> I do see we have another hand raised. Ronnie, do you wanna unmute yourself? Yes, hello everyone. I wanna give a big thank you to all the panelists and also the moderator. Um, it has been amazing so far just listening to everyone in your stories. And I wanted to ask you all a question about cultural exchange. So a few years ago, I visited Guyana for a missionary trip and automatically we were serving at an orphanage and we had arrived. I noticed that everyone ran over to the kids and they were automatically taking selfies, but no one was talking to the staff in the community or introducing themselves. And I said, this is very interesting. And some of these people have been volunteering for years. So I went over and I introduced myself and I just got to talk to them and hear their stories. And they were of the black community as well. And it was amazing and very empowering just to listen to them. Um, they talked about their ancestors and growing up. They told me different things about the rainforest, the jaguars and the Amazon rainforest. And I was astonished at all these different details. And after they were finished sharing this, they said, no one has ever asked us this and all the years that people have visited us and served in Guyana. And I just thought that was very powerful. And I wanted to ask each and every one of you, had you had those moments or stories with powerful cultural exchanges? I mean, I can go if everyone else is thinking. Uh, what comes to mind is, when I went to Cuba and I, I just loved it, I just loved it, loved the experience, loved the people. There was something about the energy of just seeing people out in the streets all times of day. Um, and I felt extremely, extremely safe there. And I had a beautiful exchange with some Afro-Cubans uh, Cubans, and they schooled me so much on how rich their African roots were and the things they knew, the languages they could recall. I mean, it was so beautiful to just exchange across cultural lines with someone who was from a different culture in the context of Cuba, given the relationship we have, it, uh, relationship the U.S. has with Cuba. It was beautiful. It was so, so beautiful. But I just loved it. So for me, it was just feeling so at home and feeling so welcome and embraced, which I think has been my dominant experience in Latin America, is just the love and the warmth, which feels like my southern roots in Mississippi. So... Um, I'll share. Yes. Um, and I, I really want to share because, right, we have someone 
um, in the audience um, whose family for me has been a wonderful uh, place of cultural exchange in Argentina. Um, so Flor Gomez, and, but her family has invited me into their home and they sometimes do these like, well, I think they always do them, but sometimes I go um, to these big Sunday dinners um, and, this, and they will teach me the, the different like Cape Verde, they, they, oh man, the cachupa they make and now I'm, like, I'm salivating, um, but the, I'll, I'll, I'll very poorly dance Suk and just that experience and that sharing of not only um, part of their Cape Verdean ancestry, but also their Argentinity, I guess, the way that they come together to create this, this these people who are very proud of both of those things, right? Um, and so I always talk about, the people say like, oh, do you like Argentina? And I say, I have a love-hate relationship. And it's, I think that's also specific to what I study, right? And then to also comment on, on is it Jackal's question? And so I think it's really important that you, what you, you the question that you raised. And so, and I, I do wanna reiterate that the way I talk about those experiences in my research is not always the way that I approach them in conversations with everyday people I meet on the street. And uh, we don't really have the time to do it here, but Jackal, I have a piece um, in a paper that just came out last year in Ethnic and Racial Studies. And there's a whole section on curi curiosity as a form of racialization. And I kind of delve into that a little bit. And that actually, the notion of curiosity as a form of racialization didn't come from my experiences, but the, the same thing about the touching the hair happens in Argentina all the time. And the same thing is that, and it's, it was actually in an interview when someone said, they tell you it's a curiosity, but it's not. And then she really just kind of lays it on the line, um, a long history of it. And so I do talk about that. There's not really time to get into it here because it's a little bit jargony, um, but you can refer there. But I think that that's, it's so important to recognize those moments of really that kind of the, the intercultural exchange that not only happens because you're in that country, but because these countries through their colonial experience have all of these these amalgamations and and just creation of new types of beauty, really, whether it's food, whether it's dance, whether it's everything. Anyways, I'll stop there. <laughs> I wanted to add something too, um, responding both questions uh, to Yakal first. Um, in Peru, uh, we are about four percent of the population who identify as Black slash Afro descent Afro Peruvian people, um, and also, like I was reading the comments, and yes, there is also a, a legacy that we have in Latin America, which is called mestizaje, um, where they try to erase blackness. That's I feel the same uh, with Sheila. You know, like Latinidad is a new mestizaje in Latin in Latin American uh, spaces. So it is very, but we are together. <laughs> There's a thing like we are, we call each other primo prima, which means cousin, even though we know we are not. Blood. <laughs> but that is like that connection that we have with each other and no matter where you come from we're going to receive you like that and then uh with Turoni well in my experience as uh, someone from South America coming here it's just also just the everyday listening um with my friends um I I live in a very black neighborhood also choosing that you know I was not going to live in Manhattan I was going to live in Brooklyn like that was a decision that I it was set on, set in stone and I was the only one that was super like conscious about that um and then it's also very fascinating how how you're always going to see intersections, even when we're so far away, even the food that we eat sometimes is just so similar in preparation. Um, so yeah, there, there is like, we're, like we might have been pulled apart, but we all share one, one root. And yeah, and we're gonna find each other and we're gonna root for each other, just as I said it before. I wanted to add to, and I want to refer to, first to Roni's question about um, humanitarian work in Latin America and the Caribbean. There's an issue there where um, there's this white savior complex that we have to address. And that comes not only from white people, but also from um, black people from the um, global North. And I guess you have to approach a host community with respect and humbleness. And that's something that we have to work on before we go to these communities. Working for five years in on field in these communities, I saw that a lot. The selfie taking, the picture taking when, benef when beneficiaries from um, aid um, were helped out. That's something that hurts 
uh, the dignity of, of people and that we have to um, address and that we have to be conscious about. And then I wanted to refer to Jacal's question about how blackness is lived in the, in the Dominican Republic. It's a little bit different from um, Cynthia's experience because we are over 80% of the population Afro descendants. And we are in denial about the existence of racism. That's something that's not on the table. When we have these conversations on um, private circles, if there is someone who's not an anti-racist um, activist, you're going to get a lot of resistance about the existence of racism in the Dominican Republic that's alive and well. So it exists in the form of colorism. Bl um, white privilege exists for um, lighter skinned Dominicans, for instance, I guess, Malika who uh, lived in the DR or has an experience in the DR can um, um, back up this um, argument. But yeah, it's something that's ex that exists, but the conversation is not on the table in the way that it is in the US. So that's uh, the difference. I saw another question um, on the chat about how I lift my blackness in the DR and here, I guess the main difference is that here, at least the conversation is open and that's something that we talk about, but in the DR it's, we are more resistant to um, saying that there's racism and that that's a problem. I just wanted to add something else. I, I know that is <laughs> it's short, but uh, like I just put in the chat that thank you for sharing that because I come from a population where black people is like, truly a minority because of the mestizaje idealism, which allows a lot of us not to self-identify, um, but also because of the experience of racism. So I was sharing that they will always think that I'm Colombian or like Dominican or something else, but never Peruvian. And also they always assume that I am an artist or a dancer, which are amazing professions, but never an engineer, uh, which is also uh, very racist. Um, and answering a question that was in the chat and which was the difference between blackness here that I've experienced and between in Peru on a positive note is that here, like the representation and the uplifting, like I learned about, about black renaissance and so many things that just like fire my soul in such beautiful ways, like talking about like building wealth, especially because I am in the field of financial liberation is like, uh, building wealth, like investing in the stock market, like just different things, like how do we diversify our investments? How do we create uh, generational wealth? Because the, the revolution needs to be funded and we already have too much against us to like not, um, we are in a capitalist world, so we are doing the best we can. Uh, and that was very important. And that is something that I take with me back home because my, my friends are always talking in connection with me. I'm actually traveling with two black American friends in a month to Peru so they can meet my, my, my Afro-Peruvian community. And it's that, that here I have seen so, so much uplift, uplifting or, of what blackness is like excellence, wealth, beauty, cleverness that is so different from our conversations there where we're still like talking about all the oppressions. And we need to understand that there's power in what we say. There's power in how we, in, like, how we talk about ourselves or stories. And Yes, it's important to address that, but it's also important to address and build a different kind of uh, monologue, uh, not for others, not to, to explain it to white people what that means, but talking to us, which also goes to Matthew's I am way and the liberation that, that means that, yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say, I think panelists will have to clap on camera if you'd like to. <laughs> Jeremy, actually, um, I, I am <laughs> I'm noticing the time. Um, did wanna make sure um, that we did, we turned it back over to you and our friends at ECA. Um, but um, since I do have the mic for a, for a hot second longer, I wanna extend a, a sincere, huge, uh, you know, tremendous gratitude to our incredible panelists Thank you all so much. This was amazing. Now you can hear my clap. Jeremy.
And also, I just want to say something too, for anybody who's like a prospective, uh, sort of looking to join the Fulbright anyway, I'll put my uh, email in the chat, feel free to reach out for me, uh, to me um, and connect more about sort of just my experience, what to expect. But ultimately, for those who are, are looking to go, uh, just go in with no expectation, bring your survivor kit and trust yourself um, and you should be fine. So I'll be quick because I actually want to leave space and time for Malika to ask everyone just kind of for final comments. But um, yes, on behalf of on behalf of the Bureau of Education, well, on behalf of the Bureau of Educational Cultural Affairs, our cooperating agencies, Fulbright Commissions, posts, all Fulbrighters out there, affinity groups, just thank you all so much for like your honesty, this conversation, this building of community, and just I think all the things that you've shared with us today. I've just seen so much affirmation and I feel like joy and excitement and also sharing of vulnerable experiences in the chat. And I feel like that's really what you all have created. So if you are willing to leave emails or contact info, please do so in the chat. To folks watching, we are going to be recording, we are recording this uh, and we're gonna basically caption it and also share it out also with a resource doc um, just to ensure that any of the resources mentioned here are out there. We wanna make sure that all the wonderful work that our panelists and our moderator are doing is able to be networked as much as possible and amplified. So that's all I really wanted to say was just thank you, thank you all so much. Malika, I will just turn it back over to you to help us sort of wrap this panel up. All right, friend, um, and I'm gonna ask my friends, um, I'm gonna ask Shayla, I'm gonna ask Priska, I'm gonna ask Matthew, and then I'm gonna ask Cynthia just to say, you know, maybe one kind of closing thought and then we'll, we'll close up. Perfect. I want to read my message verbatim because I, I don't want to miss any anything. Um, this is for future Fulbrighters, present Fulbrighter, Fulbrighters. Don't be afraid to occupy spaces where you may be the only Afro descendant person in the room. Fight against the imposter syndrome that robs you of hard earned opportunities. Become mentors for people who may find inspiration and guidance in your experiences and own your moments of joy. I find joy to be disruptive and revolutionary for people who have been oppressed. So there is resistance in our joy and be joyful and enjoy your experience and good luck. Well, I can go. Um, my comments would be um, also to Black Afro-descendant people, like I see you, I'm rooting for you, even if I don't know you, I'm here for you, even if I have, I have never heard of you. Um, believing in everything that you have, maybe anyone has like bullied you about or have been a, a roadblock, it is not. Like, and Fulbright was my first time actually saying, I'm this, I'm queer, I'm, I have done this, like actually first time intersecting my engineer career as an organization as an organizing community organizer and they gave it to me. So if I would have written what I thought they wanted me to do it, maybe I wouldn't be here, but I didn't. I just listened and I shared, this is my entire me. If you like it, great. And if you don't, I love myself and my family loves me, my ancestors love me. Um, and I'm here for you always, always and forever. And thank you for, for every word here it has been so inspiring to hear all of you. Um, I'll go. Um, so I think I will just I will reiterate something that Matthew already said is that you, know, you already have the tools of survival, um, but then also add that no matter where you are, community is important. So find your community, whatever that means for you. And sometimes it takes a little work, but it is so, so well worth it in the end if you search out a community that will make you feel home and loved and like you have a family and the place that you are. So, and, and there's community everywhere, no matter where you go, there's community everywhere and black people everywhere. So you can find it. Uh, my words would be, uh, so my experience of just traveling the world has taught me life is a lot about like learning how to swim. And I think the best swimmers are those who are afraid, who are unafraid to drown, right? The ones who are just gonna dive in and risk the possibility of what happens when you go underneath. And I think you will get so much out of your experience if you learn to allow yourself to jump in and trust that you will have exactly what you need to be able to survive and not only survive, but thrive. And then to those who are coming back, if you're on the call, 
is to really take your time to reintegrate back into life because though you've just went on this 10 mind adventure, life is still happening for people back home. And so it's gonna take some while to reestablish those connections, to get familiar with what didn't feel like it would never not be familiar. Um, so give yourself some time to just process your experience, journal, write, document, because that's an important aspect of learning how to define yourself. It's just writing yourself out. Um, and then most importantly is um, be radical in whatever that looks way for you and don't let anyone define you uh, for yourself. That's the most beautiful thing. Thank you. Like any last words that you like to share just as moderator of her or anything else? Uh, this is a tremendous joy and honor Thank you, Ashe. All right, well, everyone, thank you all for being here. Thanks everyone also for staying a little bit later past the 5.30 mark. Thank you everyone for these final words. Um, that's the end of this panel. We'll, we're gonna stop the recording in a minute. And like I said, we'll be working on sharing it out to make sure that you know this can reach